In the early 2000s, a teen heartthrob would rise and dominate the R&B charts with his unique singing talents and abilities. But as he continued to rise, his personal life was plagued with sorrows that even fame, money, and the best resources couldn't fix. Throughout it all, he prevailed by tuning into his spiritual side and singing his way through life's ebb and flow. And to this day, his melodies remain a constant in a world full of variables. This is the triumph of Mario. Born Mario Barrett on August 27th, 1986 in Baltimore, Maryland, he was destined for greatness in music. His father was a singer in a gospel group called Reformation, and his half-brother would later become a drummer. But he was raised with his mother, Sean, who also sang and played many instruments. And by the age of four, Mario himself proclaimed that he wanted to become a singer, and his mom bought him a karaoke machine, and he would sing covers of popular songs he heard on the radio, and got pretty good at it. His mother instantly knew he had a special gift, and throughout his childhood, she would gift him with different instruments, having him focus on his love for music and not the negative influences of the world around him. Growing up in neighborhoods on B-Moore's east and west sides, he said, the way I grew up, we didn't know we could dream. We weren't taught that you can achieve anything. It was just get through the next day. Around the time he was five years old, his mother and one of her friends were involved in a bad car accident that left her paralyzed from the waist down for over two years. Prior to this, she was a chemist who had a scholarship playing tennis and was one of the top tennis players in the state of Maryland. But after her accident, the doctors had informed her that it was unlikely she'd ever be able to walk again, which understandably put her into a deep depression, and she turned to substances to self-soothe. And after a while, she became dependent on those substances, oftentimes leaving Mario in the care of his grandmother while disappearing for days. And when she was home, she would spend long periods of time in the bathroom. And one night, things went from bad to worse. It was me and her in the house, and she was in the bathroom for a really long time. And uh, I went over to the bathroom, I was trying to get her attention, and I think from the way she told me the story, the pain from me like pushing the door against her leg kept her up and kept her from overdose. She said I called the cops and every, I can't really remember like all the details, but I vaguely remember mm -hmm. them like that situation. Gradually, Mario spent less and less time at his mother's and more and more time at his grandmother's, a household of 18 people living in a two and a half bedroom house. He told Nylon that he had watched a lot of his family members suffer with substance abuse and that his grandmother was big mama for real. She went to church every Sunday, cooked for the family, and tried to take care of the whole family and keep everybody together, all while holding down three jobs. She would also see to it that Mario was able to express his musical talents, per his mother's wishes. He would sing at church and at a local barbershop for customers, which earned him pocket money for his performances. He would eventually partake in many local talent shows, one in particular being at Coppin State University, where he wowed the judges and the audience with his rendition of Boys to Men's I'll Make Love to You. His performance garnered the attention of Troy Patterson, owner and CEO of Third Street Music Group Production Company, who would eventually become his manager. He would attend Milford Mill Academy, where he joined a music group with his god sister and his friend Jay, who was the son of comedian Monique. His grandmother had instilled in Mario a level of responsibility, integrity, and morality that hadn't been present in other family members. She was his rock who supported him the whole way. So when she passed away just one year later, his whole world crumbled and with it went his stability and his sanity. He began to act out, getting into mischief and even selling weed at his middle school, which in 1999 to 2000 got him in a heap of trouble. He had been staying with an aunt around this time, but Troy was determined to see Mario make something out of himself and Troy would legally adopt him and move him in with his family in New Jersey where he would continue to perfect his singing craft, ultimately snagging an audition for Clyde Davis, who had just founded his new label, J Records, and was looking for great talent. And it encouraged me, you know, every year I've got a Grammy party, the night before the Grammy. Last year it was Alicia, this year right before Stevie Wonder, and before Puffy and Busta, and right in front of him was Stevie Wonder. I put him on to sing, it knocks me off my feet. He blew everybody away. Stevie came up to me and him and said, I want to write for the next album. So if it's Stevie, and if it really is the whole industry, his record's going to number one, 
you know, right now, the album's entered the top ten. We have a huge, huge new star in the world. Mario, how old are you, man? Fifteen years old. Once Clive signed him to a seven-album deal, things picked up rapidly. Mario would make his official debut on the Dr. Doolittle soundtrack just two months later, appearing with Fabulous on the song Tamika. He would also get fast to work on his self-titled debut album, working with producers like Warren, Baby Dub Campbell, and The Underdogs. Clive gave him much creative control on this album too, with Mario co-writing every song on the album. He would collaborate with his label mate Alicia Keys, who was J Record's first and biggest artist at that time, on the song Two Train, which they wrote together and which Alicia played the piano on and sang background vocals on. But the lead single, Just a Friend, would be his breakout hit. The song samples the late Biz Marquis hit of the same name, and it was initially recorded by Usher who had planned to shoot a music video for it to coincide with an album titled All About You. But he would scrap the project and record a whole new album titled 8701, which became a classic. Meanwhile, Mario's team was in search of a smash lead single that was both youthful and fun, but could also showcase his vocal talents. And once they heard the unreleased record, it had Mario written all over it. They would change some of the lyrics and it would be the last track recorded for his album. The single was released on April 22nd, 2002 and became a summer smash, shooting all the way to number 4 on the Hot 100, number 3 on the R&B charts, and the top 10 in the UK and in Canada. For the music video, he would take it back to his hometown of Baltimore, and it was shot at a popular movie theater he and his boys used to hit up. Talk about coming full circle. And the city youth would show up and show out too for the video. Even Biz Marquis himself would make an appearance. The video would premiere on Nickelodeon and also mark the first video appearance from a young Cassie. Mario was immediately thrusted into the spotlight among other teenage acts at the time and would embark on promo tours throughout the summer of 2002 with other label mates like Monica and would also join Bow Wow on his tour that year. Mario's debut album would be released on July 23, 2002 and was certified gold by mid-September. Now initially when he debuted, he wanted the public to incorporate the Jersey slang pronunciation of his name, calling him Mario. And for several years, he would use this pronunciation in interviews, specials, and on many songs from his first three albums. Ladies and gentlemen, Mario. Yeah. What's up, y'all? This is Mario. Welcome to Sessions at AOL. We are here with Mario. Oh, I'm sorry, Mario. Did Mario. I say it right? I, I don't have the accent, you know. Mario. Mario. No, the house. Tell no, me how Mario. to say it That's right. That's how I say it, Mario. That's how I want to be like you. Say, say Mario. Mario. Very good. Is it good? Like it. I need to be in pictures, y'all. But the general public didn't move with the wave, in the same way that Rihanna had to adhere to the world calling her Rihanna, would be the same way that Mario would eventually give in to Mario. Jersey for a minute, so it was like, that's what people were saying. It's like, Mario, nigga, Mario, what's up? Mario. It's like a slang. Right. Mm. It's right. Like, so. I, I might have said it a few times. Like, yeah, because you can't Mar tell I me younger, but I like, haven't yeah. heard you say Mario. If my mother was here right now, she'd be like, why y'all calling my son Mario? Mm. Really? Like, she'd be like, it's Mario. In late 2002, his second single, Braid My Hair, became a fan favorite and was a top 20 hit on the R&B chart. The song was written about a special female friend he had who would braid his hair just before he was famous, and she would braid it anytime he came back to Baltimore, and so the lyrics were written with her in mind. Other songs from the debut album include the final single, Come On, the video for which would use the Just Blaze remix version. And my favorite song from the project was an album cut called Chick with the Braids. Mario would continue to promote the album well into 2003, appearing as himself on several TV shows like One on One, Sabrina the Teenage Witch, and in the film Uncle P, which was released years after it was filmed. He would also join his musical peers, B2K, Nick Cannon, and Marcus Houston on the Scream Tour 3, which covered over 30 dates over the summer months of 2003. To go from a treacherous home life situation to living every teenager's dream in such a short time would be enough to make anyone go buck wild with the success, but Mario kept it humble, still attending high school with his peers and remaining grounded. After finishing high school, he would embark on several European tours, and while away, it became difficult finding people who could braid his hair like his stylist did back home, and so he would cut it off and rebrand with a new image and a new sound for his upcoming sophomore album, aptly titled Turning Point, which would pivot from teenage urban pop to young adult R&B. 
though he always kept a soulful tune in his music. He would be flown out to Miami to work with Scott Storch and an array of different writers recording a multitude of songs over several weeks. They'd be inspired by Miami's party scene too, as Mario was now 18, and they went wild out there, okay? But yo, Neo, who was a skilled songwriter at this point, would play a reference track called Let Me Love You, which Mario recorded but the engineer accidentally deleted, so they would re-record it, and the second time around, Mario felt the song's power and knew it would be a hit, but no one was prepared for just how monumental the hit would be. Released in October of 2004, Let Me Love You not only went on to become Mario's biggest hit to date, but also one of the most played songs in radio history, reaching number one for nine weeks on the Hot 100 and number one on many charts across multiple countries like the UK, Canada, Germany, Europe, the Netherlands, and New Zealand. It also reached the top 10 in Denmark, Belgium, France, Ireland, Italy, Norway, Scotland, Switzerland, Austria, and Australia, going platinum in several countries and even triple platinum in the UK. The song garnered Mario his first Grammy Award nomination for Best Male R&B Vocal Performance and became an ultimate love anthem amongst listeners of all ages and races. It would also become the 8th highest selling single of the entire 2000s decade and ranked at number 45 on Billboard's Top 100 Singles in the history of the Billboard Hot 100 chart. It wasn't just a hit or an anthem, the song is literally a piece of music history and will go down as one of the greatest R&B songs of the millennium. The success of the single would also launch Neo's career as an artist, as many labels wanted to know the man behind the hit though he would later express some regret not keeping the song for himself. At the first time I got to meet Jay-Z, I walk into the room and he's in there, he's in the L.A. Reed's office, I walk in, I'm like, hey, how you doing, it's nice to meet you. He's like, man, why you get a damn song away? Like, That's worth it? Nice, nice to meet you too, bro, all right, cool. <laughs> I'm, I'm Neo, right. uh, yeah, yeah, hi, why you get a damn song away? Yeah, to, the, to this day, yeah, he get on me about giving a damn song away. But I was just a songwriter when I wrote right. it. I, I didn't write it for myself, I mean. Right. Had I known. Do you think you could have done it justice like Mario did? Um, I'll be the first to tell you that Mario got chops that I don't. You know, that I, I ain't got no shame in that. Right. Um, but I know that I got chops too. Right. So yeah, I'm, I feel like I feel like it would have worked either way. The success of Let Me Love You also launched Mario's second album, released in December 2004, to platinum status as well, which spawned a remix of the song and three more singles. The second single, How Could You was a top 20 hit on the R&B charts, and the verses are reminiscent of Tyrese's How You Gonna Act Like That. The third single, Here I Go Again, was a moderate hit overseas, but was slept on in the States, not appearing on any chart in the country. The music video would once again feature Cassie, this time as his love interest. The fourth and final single, Boom, was a minor hit that featured Juvenile. The dance party track was produced by Lil Jon, and was compared by critics to material from Usher's Confessions album. The video for Boom was directed by Benny Boom and features the remix version instead of the original. Mario would then open up for Destiny's Child on their Destiny Fulfilled and Loving It tour, which covered places like Japan, Europe, Dubai, as well as the Americas. Also around this time, Mario would take on more serious acting roles. He would establish a rapport with Ann Fletcher, who would direct the cult classic dance flick, Step Up and their connection would lead to him being cast as the character Miles in the first installment, which takes place at a performing arts school in Baltimore, his hometown. He felt the role was a perfect outlet for him to showcase his acting talents. He would star opposite Drew Sedora, and the two would collaborate on the song For the Love, which would appear on the film's soundtrack, and they killed that joint. It's a hidden gem for real. He then appeared in the American drama film Freedom Riders, which was an awe-inspiring story that grossed over 40 million at the box office. At this point, Mario had seen much success in the way of his career. However, there were many trials and tribulations in his personal life. For one, he would file a lawsuit against Troy Patterson and Third Street Music Group to void his contract with the production company, citing that he entered an agreement as a minor and claimed that he only received about 50 grand from the two albums that together had sold more than 3 million units worldwide generating about $20 million in sales for J Records. Meanwhile, Troy Patterson and his company received hundreds of thousands of dollars through its seven album recording agreement with J Records, the suit said. But Mario's reps made sure to mention that the suit was not with J Records or Clive Davis, as he valued his business relationship with the label. 
but that his suit was strictly with Troy and his production company. However, Troy would countersue just two months later, charging Mario with a breach of contract, and sued several parties for interfering with their business relationship. And Troy came for everybody in that lawsuit. Jay Records, Jay Irving, who would later become Mario's new manager, Mario's own mother, Sean, and last but certainly not least, Matthew Knowles. Now you know it ain't a real R&B lawsuit if he ain't in the mix somehow, some way. But eventually the matters were settled and the outcome was confidential. But Mario's problems were far from over, as the messy legalities with his label placed a year-long delay on his third album, which wouldn't see a release until December of 2007. But back in 2005, after the success of his second album, he had moved back to Baltimore to take care of his mother and be there for his younger brothers. He moved her into a better area and spent years trying to get her help with kicking her addiction. Together with MTV, they decided to put together a reality TV documentary, which detailed the family life struggles Mario dealt with while doing promos for his third album and singles, and how difficult it was trying to save his mother, who didn't feel she needed to be saved. I said to Mario, I'm not addicted anymore to, you know, and I said I do it selectively when I would feel like it. And on these days, when I slip off and go do something like get high, in other words, it's a lot of stuff because I'm not busy. I'm just like bored. Can't nobody, not a, not a doctor, not a detox, and can't nobody say it's over till I say it's over. It's over when I say it's over. My addiction, my disease, it's over when I say it's over. So you feel like just because you're my mother, you can do whatever you want, and I'm supposed to accept it, and that's, that's not true. That's not true. true. That's, that's very true. You're wrong at. What do no, you mean? Very true. What, what very are you talking true. about? Be specific. What are you talking Use about? Use it. At one point, they tried to stage an intervention, but she maintained that there was no problem and that everything was fine. What if I found you another treatment center to go in? Just have one thing they can tell me. You can send me the damn ten bucks. Ten. Four hundred thousand. The battle is not mine. The name of this documentary was called I Won't Love You to Death, which was very profound. Ultimately, he expressed some resentment in doing the documentary, as he felt it may have been a little too intrusive to his mother's issues, rather than aiding to her recovery. But at the same time, there were so many testimonies that came from families of former addicts who felt compelled to turn their lives around after having watched the film. He would dedicate the song Do Right to his mother, and the video featured a montage of clips from the documentary, as he wanted her and others like her to do right. He also launched the Mario Do Right Foundation, which was a nonprofit organization with a mission to educate, mentor, and support youth who were adversely affected by substance abuse in the home and in underserved communities. For this new album, Mario, looking like Lance Gross, would drop the lead single, How Do I Breathe, and it would become one of his signature songs, receiving heavy airplay on MTV and BET, and becoming a smash internationally, being certified silver in the UK. The second single, Crying Out For Me, was even bigger in the States where it went gold. And I remember that song being on damn near every woman's ringtone back then. Also, Lil Wayne hopped on the remix, delivering one of his most recited verses. And honestly speaking, this is probably my favorite album by Mario. I like just about every song on here. He had production from Timbaland, Stargate, Polo to Don, Akon, and the Neptunes, who delivered the dance groove track number one, Go. Other album favorites of mine were track 3, Skippin', which would go on to be featured in the fifth and final installment of the Step Up movie series, solidifying Mario's influence on the franchise, and track 9, Lay In My Bed, which if you play that song for your ex, she's sure to come back every time. That's the joint right there. 
But even though Mario had less writing credits on this album than on the previous two, he would join a pop R&B writing and production team called Night Riders, which also included Marsha Ambrosus from Floetry. Aside from producing a few of the songs on Mario's Go album, the team also wrote and produced for other artists dropping albums around the same time, like Jennifer Lopez, Chris Brown, Jordan Sparks, Usher, and Raven Simone. As Mario created new music for other artists, he would take an intermission from his music after releasing his last single, Music for Love, and would appear on Dancing with the Stars alongside Karina Smirnoff for the show's sixth season. They made it all the way to week eight before being eliminated. Karina was also supposed to appear as Mario's love interest in the music video for Music for Love as promo for the single, but the video never materialized. He would go on to make several recurring appearances on the PBS Kids reboot of The Electric Company, performing many jingles. And by mid-2009, Mario was back in the fold and ready to drop his fourth album titled DNA, which was propelled by the smash hit Breakup, featuring Gucci Mane and Sean Garrett that introduced a completely new sound different than much of his previous ventures. The song reached number two on the R&B charts and number four on the Rhythmic Top 40, becoming Mario's third highest charting single in the US where it went gold and recently went platinum in like 2020. The music video was ranked number seven on BET's Top 100 Videos of 2009. One thing Mario always managed to do was produce a hit. It didn't matter what was going on, which was good considering that things were about to drastically fall apart for Mario in ways that they hadn't before. While his album showcased his growth and his ability to adapt well on any beat, as mainstream music was beginning to shift into a more Euro pop sound, which was ever so present on this album, the remaining singles greatly underperformed. Not to mention the album only sold 38,000 copies in its first week, which was the lowest in his career at that point. He said, I can't say why I don't get my just due but it only makes me hungrier. I want to continue challenging myself and making incredible music that will connect with fans around the world. I plan to keep creating a distinctive lane for myself. Around 2010, he would also part ways with his manager, Jay Irving, and gossip sites began producing pics of Mario appearing to be booed up with Irving's ex-fiance, Desiree, which caused much speculation as to whether or not this had anything to do with them parting ways. Either way, it didn't paint Mario in the best image, and neither did his mugshot from October of 2010, after he was detained on a $50,000 bond for allegedly pushing his mother into a wall. In the months leading up to this, his mother's bouts with her addiction had worsened. Now Mario had tried many times to get her help, and had even placed her in the best treatment facilities that money could buy, and it would work for a little while, but then she would relapse. Now his mother was his pride and joy and those close to the mother and son will tell you that all he ever wanted to do was save her. Unfortunately, this would lead to altercations and hallucinations on his mother's part. The story behind his arrest is as follows. Mario had came home late one night to find strangers in his house, and after ordering them out, he saw paraphernalia in one of the bathrooms, which broke the agreement that he and his mother had for not bringing any substances into the home. If you're gonna do it, don't do it here. And in a fit of rage, out of frustration, he began destroying property, which prompted his mother to call the cops and give the false story, as she wasn't in her right mind at that time. Mario would be released within a few hours. His mother never pressed charges and later recanted her statements as they simply weren't true. Yet the damage was already done. Realizing that no matter how much money, influence, or notoriety he had, it would never be enough for his mother to kick her habit, he would move out of Baltimore and to LA for a few years to clear his mind and get a fresh start, which he felt was the best thing he could have ever done given that situation at that time. The troubles he went through inspired his fifth album, Restoration, which he made preparations to work on with Rico Love, but J Records would dissolve, and all of their artists were to merge to RCA Records, who didn't have the best reputation with black artists post-2010. Still, Mario would drop The Walls, featuring Fabulous, in late 2011, which managed to chart on the R&B hip-hop chart at number 58, but he would end up scrapping the project and going in a completely different direction with a new album called Evolve, which would be spearheaded by his single You Left Me, featuring Nicki Minaj, which stayed in heavy rotation on BET and saw some fanfare on the R&B charts. The track was sure to be a hit, as it was produced by Polo De Don and had been recorded by a few R&B singers like Frank Ocean and Chris Brown before making its home with Mario. 
Nicki's verse was on point too. His new album was set to be released in October and featured J. Cole and Seven Streeter. But after facing numerous delays and continuously being given the runaround by RCA, Mario would walk away and go on a hiatus. It's been said that when he left RCA, he had upwards of 600 unreleased songs in RCA's catalog that he would be walking away from in doing so. But by this time, Mario was on an entirely different plane. He would use this time to tap into his spiritual healing. He would read books on spirituality, religion, and the mind. He became a mystic, and in his time away, he learned how to navigate through the process of creation, destruction, mental stability, and learned how to move with and protect the energy God gave him. And none of this happened overnight. It was a long process, as this involved facing pain associated with years of traumatic experiences that he had endured, accepting of what was, and then letting go and embracing what is. Not easy, but necessary. Upon his return to the industry, he would appear on the show Love That Girl and recorded a new album with Scott Storch and Rick Ross called Never Too Late, which would also be shelved. Mario then found his own independent record label, New Citizen LLC, and prepared a new fifth album, which would face 511 more name and concept changes. But by mid-2017, Mario's name would be back in the headlines, but not for a new release, rather for his mother's untimely death at only 49 years old. She was never able to kick her addiction and passed away from an overdosage of these substances. In speaking on how he wanted his mother to be remembered, he said the following, My mother was amazing, silly, intelligent, and God-fearing. She was always educating me on spirituality and spoke about God every day. My mother was a great friend, chemist, and tennis player. She was a sister and a great daughter. If my mother met you, she would literally try to talk life into you. She was a visionary, very connected, and had a lot of ideas. I think if she hadn't had her addiction, she'd probably be opening up all types of resource centers. She may or may not be working with me in the industry. I know she would be doing something powerful for women and representing black women in a very powerful way. Mario always had love for his mother and spoke highly of her and to her, even amidst everything. And on their documentary, he would continuously tell her during her relapses, I just want to give you the gift of life like you gave me and always made sure to be there for her even when she refused treatment. I know the grief behind her death and his grandmother's death still greatly affect him, but he maintains that he feels their presence daily and that he knows that this 3D physical realm isn't the end all be all. He would finally release his long awaited fifth studio album, Dancing Shadows in 2018 on his independent label and it was much different sonically than his previous works and like his first album he co-wrote every song on the project. The songs Drowning and I Believe are among the best on the album along with Care For You which was a loving tribute to his mother and the video depicts Mario in different stages of his life dealing with a mother who's battling her addiction but whose love for her son is just as strong and it's definitely a tearjerker so make sure you're sitting down if you happen to watch that video. Also in 2018, Mario would return to acting, appearing in the fifth and sixth seasons of Empire, which was a perfect outlet for him to showcase his talents that are still very present and ain't going nowhere. As a matter of fact, in 2019, he would star in the live television production of the musical Rent, alongside Tanache and Vanessa Hudgens. Later that year, he would join his old peers for the Millennium Tour, which featured B2K, Pretty Ricky, Lloyd, Bobby V, etc. And the tour was a success, grossing $28 million. But throwbacks aside, Mario got music out in recent years too now. In 2020, he dropped an EP called Closer to Mars, which featured many singles with accompanying videos like Closer, Mars, and Pretty Mouth Magic. But it was the joint he did with Chris Brown in 2021 called Get Back that quickly became one of my all-time favorites by him. Man, y'all don't know nothing about that Get Back, man. Y'all go check that song out as it didn't get the recognition it deserved. Him and Chris made plans to shoot a music video for it, which would have been sick, but it never transpired. Instead, Mario would go head to head against Omarion in a versus battle in 2022, which was branded as a night of R&B, which featured an array of male R&B singers from the 2000s decade. But it was quickly turned into a circus when male egos started to get the best of damn near every artist up there. But when many of the other artists couldn't back it up, 
Mario stole the entire show and reminded everyone of his greatness. Though the overall online reception to the entire versus battle was mostly negative, it did spark a renewed interest in Mario as a singer, songwriter, and actor, driving his digital sales up quite a bit, I might add. And after this, Mario, Bow Wow, and Kerry Hilson would be the new headliners for the third Millennium Tour, with neither Omarion nor B2K on the roster. In 2023, Mario joined Neo and Robin Thicke on the Champagne and Roses Tour, and will accompany Neo for the UK leg of the tour in 2024. He's also planning a memoir titled Life in Exchange. I look forward to copping that. Currently, he's promoting his latest single, Main One, featuring Lil Wayne and Tyga. Y'all go make sure to check it out and show some love. All in all, Mario's story is one of tragedy and triumph, but he's still here and ain't going nowhere. Keep doing your thing, Mario. Even if they don't always give you your flowers, you're an inspiration much bigger than you realize to your city, to those that have suffered similar family situations, and to the fans who hold your music close to their hearts. And I just want to show you you are You should let me love you Let me be the one to Give you everything you want and need Baby, good love and protection Make me your Show you the way love supposed to be Baby, you should let me love you Love you, love you Love you. Yeah. This is Justified by Jury. Y'all know how to hit that like, and y'all know how to hit that subscribe. If you want to, do so. And I'm going to catch y'all in the next video.